Growing up in the village was, uh, was great, a uh, lot of fun, running around barefoot, chasing rabbits and uh, squirrels on the way to school, uh, early in the morning walking through the dew, um, looking forward to the times when visitors would come home and would be sent running after chicken, you know, <laughs> falling down on the ground to, uh, for a sumptuous meal. Unfortunately, we as children were given the legs you know, wrapped with intestines and, and the head. Um, the elders enjoyed the better parts of the chicken and we, we couldn't complain. Taking the cows to the river uh, every day in the evening, wondering why they had to go to the river at a particular time uh, in, in, in the day. Going to those mud schools, uh, mud walled schools in the village, sometimes learning under the tree you know, wind blowing away the blackboard, and uh, <laughs> students wishing that this always happened at maths time. <laughs> this, this life didn't continue for too long because at uh, class six I went off to board, boarding school um, yeah, in Mumias. Uh, the intention was actually to make me uh, a, a member of the, the Catholic uh, sort of priestly uh, brotherly association. Uh, that didn't quite work out due to some incidences. And uh, you can. <laughs> but I went through that and uh, I want to fast forward this and, uh, and come to Nairobi University, uh, uh, you know, after the high school and, and all that. So I came into university and that was the only university at the time uh, as, as, uh, as I grew up. Uh, my father. Uh, and I were very close. Uh, he was a disciplinarian, um, and he insisted that he must come with me to Nairobi. Now, none of us had been to Nairobi before. <laughs> so you can imagine coming to the city for the first time, uh, trying to cross the roads. Traffic lights were alien to us. He's holding my hand. I'm carrying my box. He's holding his walking stick as well. We are running across these roads in town. <laughs> across the great, great court, you know, we get registered, and he walks me across to Hall 11 and leaves me there. Now, my greatest worry was whether he would find his way back. <laughs> yeah. The university years were uh, interesting in a way. Um, I was on the studio side, although I was not, unlike Rupa, I was never the number one student, but I was somewhere in the middle. And, uh, you know, a couple of friends from high school, uh, you know, we did what university students normally did, uh, got together at the student center on, on, fri on Friday nights, you know, just to find out how the week was going and how everything else was going. <laughs> So I leave the university and uh, I get a job in one of the accountancy firms. Um, I'm living in Buruburu. Uh, since I didn't know anybody in Nairobi, so friends of mine who had been ahead of me in school are sharing a house, uh, Dan Oruoch and uh, Olo Fula. Uh, and each of them is living in this house with his brother. So these are three, three bedroom houses. So their brothers are staying in one room. So I get this... Uh, uh, Safari bed, the foldable safari board, bed, which I had bought for 100 shillings, um, which was money that I'd got through my first salary advance in the first week of, of, of work. So, <laughs> so I go and place it in the middle of their two beds, and I kind of, you can imagine me kind of uh, trying to dive into this bed every night from work. But at this time, also, the other thing which happens is I see this lady, Cyprus, uh, Atieno the daughter of Owenje. <laughs> so I say, you know, life can rise. You know, things are rising. <laughs> She's just about to go into university. She's, uh, I think, going into first year as, as I've walked out. And, uh, you know, our friendship blossoms. And, uh, you know, uh, one thing leads to another. <laughs> At the end of her first year, to cut a very long story short, we actually got married. 
and our children came fast and furious. Uh, year one, year two, year four, and year ten. Um, they are now adults and they are in this room somewhere. That's why I'm remaining guarded in what I say. But things move uh, pretty fast. It was a very rough time for her in those days, especially, you know, trying to bring up these young children, going to university, looking after, after us. Um, and, uh, you know, the first kind of years, uh, no car, no nothing. So walking to around Snow Cream on University Way to pick her up on foot, you know, number 22, Buruburu, uh, et cetera. And, and, and that was quite interesting for us at the time. I moved on, my career was moving on at the same time, so I did my accountancy qualification, I finished that within the three years. Um, I go into British American Tobacco looking for a job as an accountant, and uh, this is really where my big vision begins to happen. So I sort of say, when I grow up I want to be a CEO of something big. And I tell this to my interviewers, the finance director and the chief accountant, and they are you know, two British guys who don't see how this would happen to a 26-year-old guy. Uh, I didn't say that when I got married, my wife was 21 and I was 23, 24, you know. Um, and so uh, I get the job. Uh, things move on. I'm trying to get to the top. I'm trying to get to this CEO in, 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 in BAT. Uh, of course, it, it's not going to happen. I can't, even, <laughs> I can't even get to the finance director position because that was reserved at the time for expatriate British. Uh, so I have to change course. Uh, I leave this company, I get a job in the bank uh, at Barclays. Uh, the same struggle is continuing actually because uh, I still want to get to the top. Uh, the same, uh, um, what do you call it, glass ceiling seems to be there. But after seven years, I actually got to the finance directorship at, uh, at, uh, at Barclays and, and things were seemingly going well until a man called Richard Leakey walked into my office and said, actually, I've just had a conversation with President Moy, and he has asked me to pull together a team of six people to go into government and try and change course because the economy was doing very badly uh, in 1999. And a lot of thoughts go through my mind, you know, my job, my career, my family, Moy, you know, how do you work for Moy? You know, and... and, and, and uh, and, and, and Richard kind of says, you know, uh, but actually, when our country goes south, when things collapse here, you sitting in this Barclays Bank building will not help you. So you better come and try and uh, do some national service with me. Uh, so I get appointed permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance uh, in 1999, July. Walk into this office, don't know where to start on the 9th or 11th floor of Treasury Building. I'm pacing up and down. My heart is beating fast. Trying to sit on this chair, going round and round. I see this <laughs> green phone, which is only meant for conversations with the president. I'm opening the cupboard to see if every, anything is tapped here, whether I can actually say anything in this room. But there I was, uh, across the window was the Central Bank and the Central Bureau of Statistics. And we were six of us. Uh, we had an agenda, a reform agenda. First year went very well. Second year, once we got the money from the donors into the country, I think our usefulness was over. <laughs> one day at uh, one o'clock, one Friday, <laughs> you know the story. An announcement was made about my replacement. <laughs> Nothing was said about me. I was actually sitting at a doctor's place at Nairobi Hospital, uh, gone for a review, and at two o'clock I was supposed to go and address an international investment conference at KICC. So I'm sitting in front of this doctor at one o'clock. I'm telling him, just hurry, hurry up and do whatever you need to do with me so that I dash off. My secretaries in the office phone me. They say, there has been a change. <laughs> I say, what change? We have a new permanent secretary. 
So, of course, that was the end of uh, that story and, and, and that career bit. Uh, finished with the doctor, went downstairs. Fortunately, my driver and my bodyguard were waiting. <laughs> As you know, in those days, immediately, you were fired. You were on your own. I went down. I found Musau, my driver, and Kasoni, uh, my bodyguard, waiting there. Paul is Sanamze, say, it's okay. Say, where shall we take you? They take me to my house. Went home, got my car, phoned up my wife, told my children what had happened, said to them, don't worry, life will be okay. And I went back to the office, handed over to my uh, successor, had a team meeting with uh, the team, bid by, thanked them, and I went off to start a new career. Fortunately, I had a return ticket into Barclays, which was one of my uh, fallback positions, always have a plan B. Um, went in, the only problem is that life had moved on. I'd lost, lost my place in the queue. So although I was gunning for this CEO job in Barclays, there were other people like Eden Mohammed who had come up. And if any of you has ever lost a job or been fired, you know, just imagine what it feels like. There's a, some degree of embarrassment, some loss of reputation. Uh, people are asking you funny questions which you don't want to answer. You know, <laughs> so what happened or where are you, etc. Anyway, I had to recreate my life within Barclays. I could not get that CEO role there. But in that, I took that opportunity to do an executive MBA to position myself for the future. Moved off to South Africa, worked there for two years with Barclays, and then KCB happened. So, my friends, uh, because I'd kept touch, sent me a note saying, ah, there's an advert here for a deputy chief executive at KCB. Are you interested? I said, yeah, of course. Wrote my letters, did the interviews, got appointed as the deputy CEO. Uh, came in 18 months later, took over as CEO. So that thing which I told the guys at BAT many years earlier actually happened. <laughs> and walking again into this seventh floor office at Kencom House, I know there's some people here who work at, uh, at Kencom House. You know, walking through the VIP lift, as in the treasury, you know, you walk into this office, you have your Big desk, big room, executive toilet, you know, which is quite important. <laughs> VIP lift. So I say, ah, life is rising again. And we worked hard uh, at, 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 uh, at KCB. Uh, you know, it's all uh, on record. Uh, moved into South Sudan, into Rwanda, into Uganda, into Burundi, strengthened Tanzania, opened up Zanzibar you know, strengthened up Kenya, laid the foundation for what I believe is a great bank and will be a great bank for the future. And I really look forward to, to seeing that in the days ahead. But time, of course, comes to move on. Uh, and three, four years late, four years ago, I, I, I moved on. I wanted to sever the other, the other aspects of life, of professional life. So I moved into, into Deloitte. Uh, there's some colleagues of mine, ex-colleagues of mine from Deloitte here as well. So again, trying to see how to balance be life, having been on one side, you know, what does the other side look like? What does it feel like? How do you position yourself for that? And for as long as, you know, uh, God gives you the, the graces and the energy and the, and the, and the talent, the abilities. Uh, as I said, in all these places, when I went to the treasury and when I went especially, the first thing I did was actually to stand there in that floor and give glory to God. I actually said, you know, please give me the strength, give me the wisdom, give me the protection to carry on this role that you have bestowed upon me. And, um, you know, having moved out of, uh, of, uh, of Deloitte now, um, I'm freelancing. I'm an independent advisor. Uh, I first met Don when we were trained to be executive coaches together. I'm carrying that profession much more seriously ahead than him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I work with boards, I work with uh, individuals, uh, senior executives, 
uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, uh, I work in the area of governance and, 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 and leadership. Uh, and I do really believe that this is one thing that this country really needs. Uh, people who, people of integrity, people who can actually uh, really dedicate their life to making the lives of others better. Uh, during my time at, at, at KCB, this came to me very, very strongly when I realized that here I am looking after 5,000 employees, their lives, their lives of their families, the lives of the broader clans, really uh, will depend on how I carry out this role. And uh, it's been <clears throat> uh, a, a great pleasure uh, at that time. Coming back to the subject of rising and falling uh, and soaring, uh, I do believe that each one of us has got a story. Each one of us has got those moments when they have risen. They've got those moments when they have fallen. They've got, they, they've got those moments when they can soar. And that we need to take opportunity to take advantage of those moments. Falling, uh, in my case, refers to a couple of incidences. It refers to the time I was fired. It refers, it refers to the time that I believe I was shortchanged at Barclays. It refers to the periods in 2000, 2000 and 2004 uh, when my mom and my dad passed on. And as a firstborn, you start wondering, okay, so how do things move around here and what do we do next, etc., etc. But within all that, there's a strength that comes with it that says, just move on. Life will be better. Do something about it. And maybe falling is what gives us that impetus to think through more creatively and decide how we want to spend the next stage of our life. Thank you.